in the background, guys, I will continue to let people in as they are coming in. Rick, you have you have great service. Do you want to make make the beginning? You want to? Yeah, speak? yeah, I do. And um, and I'm uh, really really excited as I was last time. And I'm not going to waste too much time on the introduction. Now I know that a lot of you that are joining the call today were not on the first one. We sent out literally to hundreds, thousands of people the recording of the first call that Cortland did on the last, on the third Friday of July. And he was so kind to say, I'll come back one more time. Um, and, and if you knew the value of Cortland's time, you'd know what a big, uh, what a big give this is from on Cortland's part. And we just, we appreciate it so, so much. And, uh, that is why some of the people I know the personal and professional development game are on this call today uh, listening in to hear Cortland's wisdom. So without further ado, Cortland, welcome back. Thank you so much for your generosity. And uh, I'm sure everybody is as anxious as I am to hear what your words are today. I appreciate that, Rick. Thank you very much. You guys drive safe and just uh, just listen in. And again, hello, Paul and Beth and Casey and and Rick and whoever's in the RV. And then uh, to to those of you who were here two weeks ago, uh, thanks for coming back. For those of you who were not here um, two weeks ago, I'm a stranger to you, perhaps, and I'm looking to change that in short order. So um, I'm I'm grateful, and I never take lightly the opportunity to uh, to speak and to share and to have your attention. I think that uh, our most precious asset is time and leadership is what you do with it. And I, I, I really do believe it's one of the things that makes life fair, right? So whether you grew up uh, you know, in what may have been a challenge or struggle, or you grew up in opulence with a silver spoon, what makes it fair is time is, uh, uh, it, that time is shared amongst us uh, the exact same way. By that, I mean there's 24 hours in a day for every single person, regardless of how much money you came from, who your mom or dad was or weren't, you get 24 hours. You get seven days in a week, you get 52 weeks in a year, uh, you get 365 days. And so when people say, well, I wanna manage my time better, um, that's, that's, that's a bit uh, erroneous to me because it's already managed, it's already determined regardless of how much money you have, you can't buy extra days. Does that make sense? And so leadership is what you do with it. And so uh, in my view, I've never met a poor person who truly value time. And I never met a wealthy person who didn't. I've never met a, 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 an impoverished person who really valued what can be done with time. And likewise, I've never met a truly wealthy person who didn't. They recognize that it is the most uh, important asset. And so you spending or you investing your time with me this morning, uh, it matters to me. I'm grateful for it. Um, I did go back and listen to myself. I don't do that often. I don't like it. You know what I mean? You, are you, you, you ever uh, like listen to yourself like on a voice recording? And like you were leaving, like you left your voice, you le like you left the greeting on your voicemail and then you listen to the playback and you hear that voice and it's like, who is that person? You ever had an experience like, oh man, no, uh -uh, that is not. And then you look to re-record it, not because you didn't like what you said, you just didn't like your voice, anybody? <laughs> so I, uh, I endured it uh, just so I could be reminded of one, the promises that I made uh, two weeks ago because I want to deliver on that. And then also to to repeat or excuse me to not repeat what uh, what I shared a couple of weeks ago. And so those of you who this is your if you're just tuning in for the first time, uh, I'll challenge you to go and uh, and catch up. But I don't want to take away and uh, not deliver on the promises uh, to people that I made the first time. Uh, in in the first uh, call, I made uh, made my introduction. You can go there and listen to it. Um, I also expressed that uh, it's my belief that people don't log in necessarily to hear from me or to look at me or because they like my voice, um, but rather there's a there's a problem that you have and you're looking for a solution. There's a solution that you're looking for, and perhaps through however you were introduced to this opportunity. Um, there is a part of you that believes that the solution that you're looking for can be found uh, through a, an experience such as this. And so that's where um, that's where I'll be focused. All right. So what I want to know is let's see uh, if we understand the uh, uh, um, the chat 
you know, the chat function. So if you are, let's say, let's say if you're serious about your growth, okay, if you're serious about your growth, I want you to type growth in the chat because I'm gonna get a little chat involvement uh, here today. So let's just make sure that you know where the chat function is. And I get it, some of you are driving and others are not, you know, you haven't chosen to show your face yet and that's okay. All right, that's all right, that's all right. If I earn, if I earn your trust, maybe you will, okay? All right, so we got a few in there uh, for growth, okay? And so if you are, if you listen to the first recording, okay, uh, two weeks ago, just type a one in the chat. Let me get an idea of what we have, okay? All right, all right, all right. So, because there may be a, a little bit of a necessity for review, okay, all right? And what we're really exploring is resilience, okay? Because that is the quality, it is the characteristic that most determines or predicts your life success. Plain and simple, no two ways about it, right? Those who win are more resilient than those who don't. And resilience is really about your ability to, or how quickly you bounce back from adversity and challenge. That's what it's about. And it is not one of those things where you either have it or you don't. I was listening to a, uh, uh, an interview with Kobe Bryant and, uh, you know, rest in peace. But Kobe was, uh, he was, he was uh, uh, diffusing this idea of, well, either you have it or you don't. And a lot of people have bought that lie. A lot of people have bought that idea that either you have it or you don't. And Kobe was refuting that, that idea and saw it as essentially a scapegoat. He saw it as really a, a form or at least on the continuum of laziness because his view was, and I, and I happen to agree with it. He said, well, it's not true that if you either you have it or you don't, because if you don't have it, you can learn it. Everything that I know how to do today, at one time, I didn't know how to do it. From walking to tying my shoe to shooting a basketball, there was a time when I didn't know how to do it. So if it were required that I come into the world already knowing how to do it, I don't get very far. That's why a lot of the things that, that, that are necessary for us to live, like your heartbeat, your cells reproduce, your, your, your system digests, your blood circulates, your lungs do their job. That's happening through your autonomic nervous system. It's already being done for you. You don't have to remember to do that along with go out and make millions of dollars in real estate. You don't have to remember to have your heart beat, your cells reproduce, your blood circulate. Like that's keeping you alive through your autonomic nervous system. But as it relates to the things that you know how to do today consciously, there was a time in your life when you didn't know how to do it. So it is not true that either you have it or you don't. It's either you'll learn it or you won't. It is not that you either have it or you don't. Everything that you desire, to have in your life more, better, different is a skill that can be developed. And that includes your resilience and raising your resilience quotient. And that's a lot of what we're gonna be exploring a little bit today, all right? Um, uh, those of you who you're at least tuning in for the second time, you know this already, but I wanna make room for those of you who is your first time. Uh, and that is this, my style does not resonate with everybody. Meaning not everybody likes me. I like to say I'm an acquired taste. Sometimes I get a little impassioned, sometimes even a bit loud. I'm not yelling at you. It's never personal. I'm not even preaching at you, okay? Um, it's just, you know, sometimes that, that, that's the way my excitement gets expressed. But it's also true that many times I'm talking to, I'm not even talking to you consciously as much as I'm talking to the subconscious beliefs, the, the conditioned ways of thinking that are blocking you from experiencing more of the life that you want. And because of that, there will be times throughout the next oh, roughly hour or so when you will feel, you'll experience a truth and you'll know it when you hear it. You'll know it. It will resonate even if you've not heard it in that way before, because that's the part of you that I'm speaking to. And I've learned over 20 years of doing this to speak to that part, because otherwise you will gauge what's possible by consulting your past. I'll say that again. Oftentimes people are determining what's possible in their future by consulting their past. They're only determining what's possible based on what they've already been through or overcome. Am I communicating that? So it's like, well, I, I can do this based on the fact that I've done that before. And so what I'm, gonna, what I'm gonna challenge you to do is as we go through the next 50 minutes or so is don't consult your past in order to know what your future can be. 
and, and also don't have it be based on what you feel like doing. I have uh, my, my youngest son, uh, Sterling, and uh, he was just returning to college uh, just last week. And I reminded him, he's heard it a thousand times, I'm sure. I said, hey, remember now when you return to campus that this is that you're not going and you're not going to do things based on what you feel like doing. I often tell people, ignore your feelings. Ignore your feelings. Why? Because if you ever do, th if you only do things when you're in the mood to do it, if you're only going to do it because when you feel like it, there'll be a lot of days when you don't make sales calls. Yes or no? Up and down is yes, side to side is no. Right? If you're going to only do it on the days that you feel like it, be ready for a life of mediocrity. Right? If you want, you know, you want to know the little bit of difference, the little bit extra that goes a long way. Right. Be willing to do it as a result of your disciplines, not your motivations. Be willing to do it as a result of your disciplines. And when you're disciplined, you do it even on the days that you don't feel like it. When you're disciplined, you do it when you're not in the mood. When you're disciplined, you do it because you said you would. And we'll let the novices, the rookies, we'll let the amateurs only show up when they feel like showing up. OK, so that's that's some of what we're going to be exploring today uh, in part two of building resilience and removing the energy that is in the way of you having the life that you want and keeping it out of the way for good. That's what we're going to do. That's that, that's why we're exploring um, resilience, OK, because it's the number one quality. It's a skill that can be developed. And as a result of that, if you're willing to do the work, right, that's what makes it fair. Now, transformation requires that a price be paid, and there is no way around that, okay? There is no, and I know that there are a lot of self-help, you know, gurus and such that will promise you the world for you doing very little. I'm not one of those people, okay? I'm not, I'm not a gimmick. I'll be honest with you, and if you don't like the truth, then, you know, you, you can find someone else to lie to you. But the reality is that if you're going to transform your life, there is a price that must be paid. And that price might be that you log in to a training such as this on a Friday morning when there are other things that you could be doing. That's an example of a price. Uh, a price might be that you pay for coaching. A price might be that you say no to social hour because of a commitment in your business that you had made. However it works, there is a price that must be made in order or, or uh, yeah, there is a price that must be paid in order for you to make the transformation. What I've come to know about highly successful people is they value time over money. Why is that? Why do they value time over money? Well, because money can be replenished. Time cannot. So it doesn't matter how much, you know, uh, 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 money you have, you can't buy more time. So if it will save them time, they will spend or invest the dollars because they know that the dollars can be replenished. We can make up the dollars. We cannot make up the time. Well, where the novices, their first question is always, well, how much does it cost? Right? If you want to move to a higher level of consciousness, the question is not how much does it cost? The question is, well, what's the return that I would get? So let me ask you this, like, let's say that, uh, let's say, um, Debbie, can I use this as an example, Debbie? It won't, it won't be very difficult. I just want, you know, if, if you're willing to do that. Okay. Thank you. Right. And it's better than me just, you know, kind of talking to this little green dot right there. Okay. So Debbie, I'll mute your microphone and let's say Debbie, um, I, if I say to you, Debbie, if you give me a dollar, I'll give you a dollar. Okay. Does that interest you at all? You give me a dollar. I'll give you a dollar. How, how interested in, in that are you, Debbie? I don't really see the purpose of it. We're just exchanging. There you go. Dollars. That's fair. That's it's not a trick question. Um, what's the point? I already got a dollar. Right. Right. Uh, you were just gonna change dollars. I mean, they represent the same. But Debbie, uh, if you give me a dollar, I'll give you five dollars. Are you interested in that? Sure. Okay. Well, Debbie, let's say that I give you a, if you give me a dollar, I'll give you ten dollars. I'll do it quicker. You do it quick, right? All right. I like playing with you, Debbie. I'm going to take you on the road with me, okay? All right. So, Debbie, if you give me a dollar, I'll give you $20. Are you getting excited? What if I give you five? What will you give me? <laughs> well, that would make a hundred. Don't, don't, don't challenge me on my math. I know my math, okay? All right. You give me a dollar, I'll give you 20. But, Debbie, here's the thing if you give me a dollar, I'll give you $100. Yep. You'll do it. Okay. I'll slap it in your hand. 
You'll, you'll, you'll slap it in my hand. You know what, Debbie, but you know what a lot of people will say? I said, well, if you, you know, you give me a dollar. I say, well, you give me a dollar, I'll give you a hundred dollars. And what a lot of people say was, well, I don't have a dollar though. You're like, what? Go find it. Right. You know, well, I mean, but the interest, well, go borrow. If, 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 I'll give, if you give me a dollar, I'll give you a hundred dollars. And well, I don't have a dollar. And then I said, well, well, go borrow it. And then some people are like, well, the interest rates are too high. <laughs> I'm like, I wouldn't care if the interest was 100%. If you give me a dollar, I'll give you $100. Then you go borrow that dollar. I'll give you the $100 you take and repay the $2. You still got $98. Right. Okay. That's how I equate training such as this. You give me an hour and it can transform the rest of your life. But a lot of people will say, well, yeah, but I don't have an hour. So they continue to do the same thing that has gotten them where they are. But if one hour could equate to 20 years of learning and development, then you invest the one hour. That's where we're headed, okay? So where we dropped, where we stopped last week, we, we first started to explore uh, resilience, and we said, well, first and foremost, resilience is about uh, the materials of which you are made. So be that a, you know, we, we use the example of a drinking glass and a basketball. And I said, we're standing on a four, at top of a four story building and uh, there's concrete below. I drop the basketball, I drop the drinking glass. What happens? Well, the basketball bounces and the glass shatters because the basketball is made of materials that are elastic. The drinking glass was tempered at uh, or heated to 1700 degrees. That's pretty hot, 1700 degrees. And they were able to shape and mold it into that drinking glass. But essentially the drinking glass was created out of stress. So when it hits the concrete, it shatters because the resistance of the concrete, right, breaks it apart. Whereas the, the, the basketball, is made of materials that are elastic and enables it to bounce back. I use that to equate now to human beings. And if you're going to be resilient, you must first be reminded of what you are made of. And I said, you are made of things that allow you to bounce back from challenge and adversity. Notice I did not say that there is a way for you to, uh, to be absolved from or exonerated to skip to, to not have to deal with challenge and adversity, that's not a promise, right? That's gimmicky, okay? Everybody gets adversity, everybody gets challenged, but you are made of things that will allow you to bounce back. But what happens is life happens, our life experiences happen, and we forget what we're made of, okay? So this is just a brief review. So we forget what we are made of. If you look at a small child coming into the world, we come into the world uh, trusting and deserving and worthy and the desire to be seen and willingness to take risks and persistent and determined, so forth and so on. Then life happens or life experiences happen. And from our life experiences, we interpret that event or experience in such a way that we're taken out of the truth of who we are. That's where it begins. So you come into the world trusting, and then something happens, and you determine that, okay, well, no, uh, trusting isn't safe, or it's not good to trust people, or if I trust people, they're going to let me down, or if I trust that I'm going to be betrayed, I'll be abandoned, and so forth and so on. So your interpretation of an event or experience is what then uh, removes you from or displaces you from the truth of who you are. So the reason why we started there two weeks ago is first and foremost, like the basketball or the drinking glass, what are you made of? It's fundamental. It's foundational to creating the life that you want. It is foundational to creating a life by design is to be reminded or to remember the truth of what is inside of you that you can use as a resource to create the life that you want. It's fundamental how you came into the world. Then life happens or life experiences happen. So 
Well, the promise from two weeks ago was that I would share with you how you actually transform a belief. Okay. And then we'll, we'll, then we'll look at the, the, the process. Okay. Or the science behind it. We're going to look at the process first and then the science behind it. So if you are going to transform your belief, there are four things that you have to do. And this, uh, the, these four things that you have to do is first, you have to identify the limiting belief. That's where it starts, okay? You have to identify the limiting belief. What is the way of thinking? What is the way of thinking that gets in the way of you having what you want? And so in the chat, in the chat, uh, so this is gonna be more interactive, my hope is, uh, but be safe if you're driving, don't participate with, with texting and so forth. But in the chat, I want you to enter in the chat a, prim a primary limiting belief for you. Okay, a belief that you have about yourself, a belief that you have about other people, a belief that you have about life, or a belief that you have about the world. Okay, a way to uncover that belief is to think about, okay, fear of failure. Thank you, Debbie. A way to think about this belief is to think about a goal or dream that you have. And then when you think about having that goal or dream, what then are the conversations that you have with yourself that you know don't support you getting it? So first, think about something you want. Maybe you want uh, you want to uh, attract five hundred people into your you know uh, real estate team who are business builders, or you want to sell five million in home, or you want to sell a hundred homes in a year. Just think about a goal or dream that you have, and when you think about having that goal or dream, okay, once the hypiness wears off, what are some of those conversations that you have with yourself? And you know that if you continue to think that way, okay, that that way of thinking will not support you getting the goal. All right, so I'm gonna take a moment because I see some participation here. Uh, okay, it, 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 uh, that it has to be hard, okay. Uh, I don't have the knowledge. Uh, another limiting belief from, uh, I was gonna say Bridget, but Birgit Anderson. Uh, it's not, I'm not good enough or I don't have the ability, okay. Uh, people won't take me seriously, says Madeline. Uh, Kristen, uh, self-doubt. Uh, Betty Fernandez, thank you. Fear of rejection, and I'm not good enough. Uh, late to the, and Iris says uh, it's too late to start, or I'm too late to, to start. Uh, I'm not smart enough. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, Anna, my success will hurt others. Uh, uh, another husband as wonderful as my last one. So, oh, I won't find a, a husband. That's I'm interpreting that. I won't find a husband as wonderful as my last husband. Uh, and then various opportunities. So you got the idea, all right? So, or, or again, and thank you, Andrew, lack of knowledge, okay? So what happens is we have these, so we got to first identify the belief, right? And so thank you there, that's, that's our start, all right? Now, you might look at it, and if we're working together, we might slow, we may look at it and say, well, is that really the one, like the, is that the anchor one? It may be, it may not be, but first we identify the belief. Once we identify the belief, then we move into step two of the process, which is where we identify the event or experience. Okay, that's, that's the stage two in the process, is identify the experience or identify the event. And what am I talking about? Well, those beliefs are not beliefs that you came into the world with. Does everyone agree with that, right? Just, uh, if, you, if, if that makes sense to you, just type a one in the chat. OK, you, when we look at some of those beliefs that I just read off, OK, uh, I don't have the knowledge. I'm not smart enough. I'm not good enough. You know, uh, fear of rejection, self-doubt. Notice how. So, so this ties back to what we were saying earlier about how we come into the world. Right. So you'll notice if you if you if you if you work with me any period of time, I like to build a case. So usually things build off of something previous. So the reason why I explore, well, we got to be reminded of how you came into the world is because if you have small children or you know people who have small children or you can remember being a small child, then there, I, I believe you will agree that children don't come into the world having a fear of failure. In fact, they'll try anything. They don't come into the world believing that they're not smart enough. They don't come into the, they're not born into the world believing that they're not good enough. Okay, 
That's not what happened. So the reason why you want to be reminded of how you came into the world is so, because if we can connect that you did not come into the world that way, then this new belief that's in place of I'm not smart enough or my success will hurt other people or uh, I'm, I'm not good enough or I'm not deserving, right? Then you say, well, okay, something had to happen in order for that belief to now be in place because I didn't come into the world with that one. Does that make sense, Mr. Ramsey? All right, I didn't come into the world with that one, so something had to happen. So part two or step two in this process then is to identify what was the event or to identify the experience. We did a little bit of that uh, uh, with one person last week, okay? Identify the experience. What was, like, what was that event? All right, now, step three, and, and the reason why, let me, let me hold on just a second. The reason why we wanna do that is because if we can identify the event or experience, by identifying that event or experience, then it becomes um, easier to reconcile that, okay, I have not always been this way. This is not how I have always been. Something happened and then my interpretation of the event. Now, I'm gonna say something that may sound offensive and you know I'm on the other side of the screen, so even if you wanna choke me or hit me, uh, you won't be able to, okay? So, and this is what I'm gonna say. There is no inherent meaning to any event. There is no inherent significance to any event. Another way to say that is, there's nothing that has ever happened or occurred in your life that means anything. It was just an event. All of the meaning or all of the significance, we assign it. We give the event a meaning. There is nothing that has occurred in your life that means anything. We assign or give it the meaning. I shared uh, two weeks ago at four years old, my dad left home. My interpretation of that was that I'm not lovable. I'm not good enough. I'm a bad kid. If he loved me, he would have taken me with him. That was my interpretation of that, right? But my dad leaving home did not mean I could not be successful. It did not mean that I was not worthy, but it did take on that meaning because of the, the significance that I assigned. Fair enough. With me so far? Okay. All right. Uh, yes, Betty. Oh, so in that situation that you experienced, mm -hmm. what is the turnaround for you to say, okay, they, what? They. It wasn't, it wasn't me. It wasn't about me. Oh, okay. oh you want to know how, how we transform that belief. What was the, what was the belief that it became? Yeah, that's what yeah. we're doing here. You want it right now, don't you? <laughs> okay, well, I don't want you to take too long. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I love you. Get, like, get to it. Okay, so you're, so this, this process that I'm going through, Betty, all right, this process that I'm going through is how you actually go about transforming a belief, okay? I call it belief alchemy, okay? So uh, uh, this, is, this is a process that I use to transform a belief. But first, we first, if we're gonna transform it, Betty, we gotta first know what the belief was. So if I'm looking at that for myself, okay, the belief of I'm not good enough was running my life. That was the belief, that's step one, identify the belief. Step two, identify the event or the experience where that belief took shape. I said, oh, I know exactly when that was, four years old, my dad leaves home. That was the event where that belief started to take shape. Follow? Okay. So once you identify the belief, you got to do the work to, you got to be willing to revisit your life so that you can identify where, where did that start? Where did I, where did I first start to believe this about me? Or where did I first start to believe this 
about men? What did I, where did I first start to believe this about women? Where did I first start to believe this about money? Where did I first start to believe this about my health? Where did I first start to believe this about business or me as a business owner? Where did I first start to believe this about uh, this culture or this race of people? What did I first start to believe about people who practice this religion or people who don't even practice a religion? Where did I first start to believe it? You gotta identify the experience, okay? Then part three is you have to be willing then to re-experience the event. Re-experience the event. Now, when I say re-experience the event, okay, when I say re-experience the event, Madeline, I'm not saying that you go and re-enact the event, but re-experience it through uh, the feelings and the emotions that you recall from the experience itself. So what did it, so what did it feel like when, you know, I, so I would look at it and say, well, what it, I, would, I would take myself back to what it felt like that, uh, that morning when my dad left home. I can remember that morning as vividly as though it was just hours ago. And I remember him, I remember waking up, he, he and my mom were arguing. I, uh, I have on a, a Tweety Bird, a long sleeve, yellow t-shirt with Tweety Bird on the front of it. And kind of wiping, you know, the sleep out of my eyes. I get out of bed, I hear them yelling. I go into the living room. And when I go into the living room, uh, I, my, I see my mom's face, she sees me, my dad has his back to me. And then I think it was based on how he looked at her. She, he could tell she saw something. And he turns and looks at me and says, tell your mama to give me my keys. Okay. <laughs> mama, give daddy his keys. She says, I will. You just go back to your room. Now, I started back to my room as though, you know, job well done. It was great. No problem. And as I'm going back to my room, I hear the door slam shut. And I look, my mom is still on the couch, she's crying. But my dad wasn't in the room. Now, I was that kid that would throw an incredible fit whenever I couldn't go with my dad. So uh, he was now not there, which means he was leaving. So I run to the door and when I get and I open the door at four years old. And when I open the door, he's getting into the car. And I'm like screaming, daddy, 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 wait, 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 I want to go. He looks up at me and he says, I'll be back to get you. So I close the door. I go back to my room. I'm taking off that Tweety Bird t-shirt and I'm going through my drawer and I'm looking for something to put on. I knew how to get myself dressed. And as I'm getting dressed, my mom walks into the room and asks me, where are you going? And I said, oh, daddy's coming back to pick me up. And just by the way she looked at me, she didn't say anything. By the way she looked at me, I knew that things were about to change. I didn't know how, but I knew that life was going to be different. How many of you have had uh, an experience, uh, maybe not like that experience of like a parent leaving, but in your life, particularly younger, uh, type a two in the chat if you've had an experience where when it happened, you knew or you felt that things were gonna change and not necessarily for the positive. If you've had an experience like that, just type a two in the chat, if that's you, if you've ever had a moment like that, where you could just feel it. You didn't know how, you didn't know what, yeah, that, okay. So it, it, particularly those ex experiences where you feel or you just like, man, it is, it is, I didn't know how, okay, but I knew and I felt that things were going to be different, okay? All right, so it was now, <clears throat> this is a little aside and I, and I promise I'll still have time to finish, Betty, don't worry, okay? So that event, all right, I was not conscious, and this is very important, I was not consciously aware of the belief that was taking shape at the time. I was not consciously aware of it, okay? So your belief took, uh, took shape at an age where you were not consciously aware of the belief being put in place. I was not consciously aware of it. But as I look back on that event, it was that event that started to shape the belief that I'm not good enough, I'm not deserving, 
I'm not lovable. Why? Because even though my dad said he was coming back to pick me up, he never did. So at four years old, I get dressed because dad said he's coming back to pick me up. Mom comes into the room, asks me where I'm going. I tell her, and just by the way she looked at me, she didn't say anything else. She turned and she walked out of the room. At four years old, I kept getting dressed. Am I communicating this? And so from four years old to age 24 years old, yes, you heard that right. From age four years old to age 24 years old, it was as though I was living my life in a way where I was still waiting for him to come back and pick me up. Now, I'm 24 years old, so intellectually, yeah, I get it. I'm out of high school. I'm, hell, I'm in college now. So I know that he's not coming back to pick me up. But a lot of how I lived my life from that point to that discovery at age 24, it was all about how can I be good enough so that my dad comes back to pick me up. So I made good grades, not because I was exceptionally you know, smart, but whenever I would talk to him, he would always ask me about my grades. I wanted to have a good report. That was it. That was my motivation in school. Didn't really love school per se. I just wanted to have a good report. Athletics, the same way. I have state championship trophies and rings and so forth. Um, I was uh, uh, state champion in track, you know, state tournament basketball teams and so forth. Uh, trophies and plaques still to this day, almost 30 years later, still at my mom's house in the closet because I, I, I don't have an emotional attachment to them. But when I would talk to my dad on the phone through those years, I wanted something good to report. So I worked really hard. It was a concept such as this. I'm 24 years old. We started to explore this concept. And it was in that moment that it dawned on me that he was not coming back to pick me up. And the reason why that was so profound was because at that point, I did not know what I wanted in my life or for me because everything was based on, everything was based on what can I do to make him proud or what can I do to get him to love me and like me again? Some of you can relate to that. Some of you can 100% relate to living your life on behalf of someone else because you're waiting for them to say, I love you, I'm proud of you, good job, whatever. And even though you can hear it from a thousand different people, that one person hasn't said it and it drives you insane because you haven't heard it from that one place. Okay. So when I say, and for some, it's like, and, uh, Betty, I, I see a note, your comment here, and never did. So it's like, okay, well, what happens if the person you wanted to hear it from is deceased? Or what happens if the person you wanted to hear it from is no longer here? Like, what do I do then? Right? It's like, I'm stuck if I continue to be dependent on that. So when I say re-experience the event, you got to be willing to go back to the event and relive the emotions and the feelings. Why? Because those emotions and feelings, as, as you were feeling those emotions, or as you were experiencing those emotions and having those feelings, then there was a narrative or a framing that was taking place. You were assigning that event or experience a story. You were giving it a meaning. You were developing a belief. So you have to go, and it is because of your emotional connection to that event through the story or the narrative that you gave it, that now you go out into your life and you will prove yourself right about whatever that belief is. So when I say re-experience it, you take yourself back to it, just like I just did a moment ago. Take myself back to four years old, waking out of bed, seeing my mom, seeing my dad, uh, hearing what he asked me to do, uh, doing it hearing the door slam shut, running to the door, going back to my room, starting to get dressed, my mom coming in, 
then waiting, and then she leaves, then waiting all day and waiting all the next day, waiting for a week, waiting for a month, waiting for years. I waited for him from four, age four. I didn't see him again until I was nine. And all the while, all the while, as I got to move forward though, right? So the subconscious mind has to move forward. So in order to move forward, I have to make sense of what I've experienced. And in order to do that, we assign a belief or a meaning. So a moment ago, I said, there is no inherent meaning to any event or experience. We assign the meaning. The meaning I assigned was, I'm not lovable. I'm not good enough. Uh, and a moment ago, I asked you to type into the chat, your limiting beliefs. So we look at, okay, well, where, what was the event where that belief began to take shape? And then part three, we re-experience the event emotionally. We allow ourselves to feel it again. So sometimes what happens is people are like, well, I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. I found a way to block it out. I don't want to go there. Uh-uh, it's too much. And, and then they have a lot of resistance to re-experiencing the event. Well, here's what I've come to know in 20 years of doing this. In 20 years of doing this, this is what I've come to know. Your freedom is on the other side of what you resist the most. Okay, Anna? Your freedom is on the other side of what you resist the most. So the area where you are resisting the most, okay, if you're willing to do the work to move through that, that's where you'll find your freedom. And then number four, after you re-experience the event, part four is you reframe, okay? You reframe, or as you reframe, meaning you give it a new meaning or a new story. That's important, to reframe through a new meaning, a new story. You made it up in the first place. You made it up in the first place. So give it a new meaning. And it really is. Now, uh, a lot of, you know, well, I, I won't do that. Uh, there are some business models that don't want you to know that it can be that simple. But it is. There are a lot of business models that make a lot of money convincing you that it's a lot more work. The reality is that where people get lost is in re-experiencing the event and in identifying what the event was. But once you're in the experience of it, okay, you can tell yourself a new story. So last week <clears throat> or two weeks ago, when we looked at the three Ps, uh, personal, pervasive, and permanence, what that really is getting to is what that, what that really gets to is your explanatory style. So some of the magic that you have as a human being, your power as a human being, is your ability to, uh, it, one of the key determinants of the, uh, the life that you'll experience is your explanatory style. Explan explanatory style simply is how do you explain to yourself or what is the narrative or the story that you give to yourself when events happen, when adversity comes up, when you are challenged, what is that conversation? What is the internal dialogue that you use when faced with, uh, with adversity and difficulty? We looked at the three Ps. Well, you know, some people take it personal, others do not. Some people have it, see it as pervasive, it spreads everywhere, other people are able to keep it local. And then another is permanence. Some people see it as lasting forever, and some people see it as just a bump in the road. That is also related to your explanatory style, okay? So how you explain to yourself, how you frame what has happened is a key to your being resilient. It, it, it increases your resilience quotient, your explanatory style. How do you explain the advantage, uh, how do you explain the adversity and the difficulties of your life? I always encourage people to go earlier in life, not, oh, well, when I was 32 or when I was 40, go early, like before age 10. Like wh why? Because 80% of your programming and conditioning is in place by the time you're eight. So for the most part, 80% of your beliefs about yourself, other people, life and the world, 80% of it has been in place since you were eight years old. And then what's happening today, what's happening today is you are attracting into your life the evidence necessary for your belief to get confirmation. 
That's what's happening in your relationships. That's what's happening with your health. That's what's happening uh, in your spiritual practice. That's what's happening with your business. You are only experiencing your business in the way that fits what you believe about yourself. That's it. You're only, only experiencing your business. You only see your business, the economy, opportunity. You only see it in the way that fits what you currently believe. That's how powerful you are. All right. So what I want you to do uh, there on your notebooks, for those of you who are keeping notes, those of you who are driving, use your power of imagination. All right. I, uh, so I want you to draw uh, what I'll call a cross, but in, 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 in your notebook or somewhere where you have some room, draw a vertical line and then cross it with a horizontal line so that it creates four quadrants. So that it creates four quadrants, okay? And then um, in bottom left quadrant, bottom left quadrant, we'll call that quadrant number four. Bottom right quadrant, we'll call quadrant number three. Quadrant number two is top left. Quadrant number one is top right. And then I just kind of put like a little kind of little arrow at the top of the vertical line. And then I put another arrow to the right of the horizontal line. And so if you wonder what I'm doing when I put my head down, this is what we got. This is what we got. All right, little arrow there at the top. All right. So we're going to look at real quickly motivational drivers. Okay. Motivational drivers and <clears throat> what they are and represent for us, okay? Motivational drivers, what they are and what they represent and, and why, okay? And then while you're writing, I want you to write down this phone number, 918-262-5100, 918-262-5100, 918-262-5100. I got inspired after uh, two weeks ago, I got inspired to uh, really develop some more around this content. And if it is of interest to you, uh, uh, there's no, you know, I'm not charging you anything. This is a free webinar uh, where I go into this in greater detail. And if you'll text uh, webinar to that number, then it'll register you for the free webinar that I'm going to do on it next week. All right. So that uh, 918-262-5100. All right. So now motivational drivers. We got quadrant four, three, two, and one. Quadrant. So at the so here's what Viktor Frankl determined. Viktor Frankl said this: that essentially success has two components, right? And if we define success as the 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 pursuit of a worthy ideal, all right, that's Earl Nightingale. So don't get too caught up in the names. I just, I've read a lot, all right? So the worthy pursuit uh, uh, or the, the, the continuous pursuit of a worthy ideal is what we'll call success, okay? Uh, the continuous pursuit of a worthy ideal. So what that means is you could act by that definition, you could consider yourself successful if you're even in the pursuit of it, all right? And then Viktor Frankl, who wrote the book, Man's Search for Meaning, Victor Frankl recognizes that success has two components, right? Two components. There is a, one, one aspect of success is a result, all right? So a tangible outcome, tangible outcome. And the other is a, a level of fulfillment or purpose that comes from achieving that outcome, all right? So your vertical line, all right, your vertical line is what we'll call the result. So above that vertical line, above the arrow, just write in result. And uh, the horizontal line is what we'll refer to as fulfillment or purpose. Okay, fulfillment or sense of purpose. All right. So now you're going to be you you're going to find yourself in one of four places. One of four places where you'll find yourself. Quadrant number four, the lower left hand corner. That would represent that the results are down and that sense of fulfillment and purpose is also low or down, okay? I'm like close to zero or nothing at all on the result side and close to zero or nothing at all on the fulfillment side. This person is in that quadrant what we'll call floundering, all right? So floundering, so you can just write down floundering, 
uh, there to label that quadrant. All right. This individual is like, you know, what's the, you know, what's the purpose of even existing? You know, uh, they really go to a place of like, why am I even here? My life has no meaning. I'm not getting what I want. And I don't feel even fulfilled in the pursuit of anything. It's just kind of an existence that is empty. It's hollow. I'm just here. That's unli it's unlikely that that's any of you on this call because people who are floundering really don't attract opportunities like this. But I want you to have the label anyway. All right. So results are low and fulfillment is low. That's floundering. In quadrant number three, it's my results are, not, are low, so the results aren't in yet, but I feel a sense of fulfillment or, or purpose in what I'm doing. So I'm not where I want to be, but I'm feeling like some like energy, some sense of fulfillment, a, a drive, even though the results aren't in. In this individual, we will label unrecognized. So type unrecognized or write unrecognized. In, in your notebooks there, okay, unrecognized. Now, this person, uh, a person who's unrecognized, again, the results aren't in, but they feel a sense of purpose. You'll find this a lot in, uh, for, particularly what comes to mind is like uh, direct sales or network marketing, um, even, uh, even getting started in your real estate business, right? You can feel really pumped up, really excited about the opportunity. And I recognize that we're real estate agnostic uh, on this call, um, but I just have a, you know, affinity for EXP. So that's the one I'll mention, but you could just be getting started, right? You could just be getting started. But you haven't, so you're passionate, you found something that you love, but you don't have the results yet, okay? And you look to get other people involved with you, and a lot of times what they'll ask is, well, how much money have you made doing it? Is it working for you? And you're like, well, not yet, but I really believe that this could be it. I really believe that this could be the thing. But you haven't got the results just yet, although you feel a sense of purpose and fulfillment. Uh, in the movie, let's, let's say we, we refer to this person as like the starving artist, okay? And that starving artist is a person who is like all they want to do is sing and perform. And even if it means sleeping on mom's couch until and I'm 60 years old, doesn't matter. When people say go get a real job, it's like, nope, not doing it. All I want to do is play music. Now, what happens in the movies, in the movies, in the movies, what happens is some philanthropic person walks in through, walks into that dive bar one night, hears them sing, and it's like, man, that's the most you know wonderful voice I've ever heard, and I'm going to put money behind you, and you're going to go all the way to the top. That's what happens in the movies. In real life, they die that way, unfulfilled, resentful, because they never got their break, right? Unrecognized. And then uh, quadrant two, quadrant two, the results are there, but the fulfillment or sense of purpose has been lost. The results are there, but, you know, fulfillment and purpose has waned. OK, this person is experiencing burnout. Burnout. This individual, like on the surface, they've got everything you could possibly want or imagine. Everything you everybody else looking in at them is like, man, how could you want anything else? How could you want anything else? You've got the money, you've got the house, you've got the dog, you got the, the, the white picket fence, you got everything. How could you not be happy? So on the outside, it looks as though they've got it all together. But internally, because they've lost the sense of purpose and there's no fulfillment, they're burning out. And if they're not careful, they risk sabotaging everything they've built, everything that they've created. They're on the verge of losing it or destroying it through, it could be addiction, through uh, laziness, through self-sabotage, through imposter syndrome. They're on the verge of losing everything that they've built or created, even though on the surface it looks wonderful. It's because they lost a sense of purpose. And then... Quadrant one is what we'll just uh, label as thriving, okay? That's where the results are high and the sense of fulfillment is high. So I, I, I maintain my sense of purpose and, and I'm getting results. The results are tangible. I'm not just talking about what I can create. I'm not just talking about what I'll do one day, like the results bear it out. 
when you come to a company like convention or conference, you see me on stage being recognized. And uh, my, my, I, I have people, I am surrounded by people who are also growing. Uh, they're expanding. And so, and I feel a sense of fulfillment and purpose in that. So the results are high and the sense of purpose is high. That individual is thriving. Okay, so I want you to like do an accounting for yourself and ask yourself which of those four quadrants do you find yourself in? Quadrant four, three, two, or one, and enter that into the chat uh, just as I begin to close. Just as I start to close, where do you find yourself? There's no judgment for me, okay, but something very powerful happens when we acknowledge what is. When we acknowledge what is, okay? I see, uh, I see unrecognized, I see burnout, I see one, I see a thriving, I see some unrecognized. All right, so what that, what that informs me, Rick, okay, what that informs me is that you have, uh, that this group is a lot of people who found a sense of purpose, but the results aren't yet where you want them to be. Is that pretty accurate from those of you I can see up and down is yes, side to side is no, okay? So if the results are not yet in, OK, but you but you're loving what you're doing or you feel like you found a place where you can be effective, then you making the jump to thriving really does come down to mindset. And the application or implementation of skill or uh, the application and implementation of the system. So somebody asked one time, well, which is more important, skill set or mindset? I said, well, that's kind of like asking which is more important for walking the right leg or the left. We need them both. Okay, so, but I would, I would definitely lean more towards mindset because I can teach the skill. But regardless of how much teaching I do around the skill, if the individual does not have the growth mindset, we're not gonna be effective. So if it is your desire to thrive, my recommendation to you is to get committed to your personal development and personal growth where you make the first and third Friday these calls, even on days when you don't feel like it, you make it a priority to be a part of these calls. And even if you're just listening in the background over and over and over again, uh, it's, it's, you know, it maybe feels like it's the same thing over and over and over and over again. But what's happening is there's a shifting that is occurring in your consciousness, not conscious level of mind, but subconscious level of mind, because those who are thriving have committed to their personal development and personal growth, and they make the investment. They see themselves as worthy of the investment, be it time-wise or financially. They see themselves as worthy of, mute yourself, right? They see themselves as worthy of the investment of time and of dollars. So moving to a place of thriving is not just reserved for the, the, the Selenas and the Annas of the world. It's not just reserved for the Jihas and the Caseys of the world, right? It's, it's, it is, however, there, it, it does require a reservation, okay? And the way you secure the reservation is through being willing to pay the price of transformation. So the butterfly or the caterpillar becoming a butterfly does not happen without paying the price to develop the wing strength necessary for it to break free from the cocoon on its own. And why is that? Nature has determined that, not Cortland. Nature has determined that that butterfly must develop wing strength to break out of a chrysalis or the cocoon on its own. Because why? Well, because for a butterfly, its protection against predators, its protection is its chaotic flight pattern. So unless it has the wing strength to fly in a chaotic pattern, then it won't be able to protect itself. What you're going through in building your real estate business or practice and the day in and day out of working the system and being committed to the disciplines that are necessary and the mundane and the routine and the fundamentals and the things that you get bored with, the reason why that's necessary, I said last week, more people aren't successful because they don't do a simple thing for a long enough period of time, right? Time, uh, time has them, you know, eliminate themselves. A simple thing done over and over and over again is really the key or secret. And what's happening there is, yes, you're mastering skill, but through that process, you're developing a resilient mindset so that when you get what you're after, you have what it takes to sustain it. So being willing to do the disciplines 
showing up, you know, every other Friday in this instance, or reading the books, or uh, 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 attending the courses, making the investment, what you're doing there, yes, over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, is you are refining yourself and your mind to be able to sustain what it is that you create. All right. So um, that's what I got, Rick. I don't know if you're still driving, but I'm no, I looked up and noticed the time. So I got I to gotta drop off right there to be mindful of the time. Um, I don't have anything for uh, sale. I do have an offer. And that is, if you would like to explore more about the laws of energy, that because everything is energy and the highest form of energy is thought. And if there's a place that you desire to be, like being unrecognized, but you and, and you want to be at thriving, if everything is energy, then that means nothing is left out. So that would mean that whatever is blocking you is a form of energy. And what we'll explore in that webinar is uh, how to identify what it is that's in the way and then what's necessary for you to remove it. Um, you text 918-262-5100. Text webinar to that number. Don't worry, it's not my real cell phone. Uh, but you text webinar to that number. There'll be a registration uh, page, and then we'll I'll be able to email you when we start the webinar. It's free of charge, and that's what you got. Rick, man, I told you I'd come back, and I'm gonna say it again. I'll come back. Maybe not in two weeks, but if you invite me back, I'll come back again. All right. So with that, Rick, yeah. Can you hear me? You. Can you hear me, Cortland? I, I hear you. I do. All right, great. My uh, video has been uh, not really good, but. Man, this is very, very powerful. Uh, there was four of us in this RV all taking notes, except Casey. Sorry, she was driving. Uh, That's but wise. we were definitely, yeah, we were definitely committed. Uh, I definitely want to get the registration number so we can put it in our outgoing email. I'm assuming since it's on the recording and Selena, I don't know if you got it, but um, we definitely want to send that out to everybody so that others will register that are listening to the recording and not on your calls. Um, to get more and more people. When will that webinar occur? That's the only thing I did not hear. I, uh, it's uh, uh, August 9th, August 9th. Oh, perfect. Yeah. So that August gives us 9th. plenty of time to advertise yeah. it and get it sent out. So yeah, we, I just really, really wanna thank you. I will invite you back probably towards the end of the year so we can have a conversation about launching a new year and having a new oh, mindset for that. a new year. I would yeah. love that. I, 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 I you know, I'm, I'm kinda, you know, I'm bragging on myself, but I've done a lot of research around goal setting. And so I would love to share with your group some of the things that I found as it relates to setting goals that actually get accomplished. Yeah, I will definitely. Welcome to my last like four days. Okay. Rick, we, we can't lost hear you. Rick. We can't, we can't hear you. <laughs> we lost you. Again, Cortland, thank you again. Incredibly powerful. I'm sure everyone here agrees. Everybody just like jazz hands <laughs> in the video. Um, we really do appreciate it, guys. I will be posting this video in our YouTube channel. We'll most um, likely make it the last. He's still, he's still going. Um, we love Rick Chiha. Um, <laughs> so the YouTube, it'll be in our YouTube um, and we'll be sending out the newsletter and everything so that anybody who wants to watch it again or send it to anyone again, um, you will be getting that as well. So look for that coming. Really wonderful having you again, Cortland. Thanks so much. And good to see all these wonderful faces here today. Thanks everybody. Absolutely. Thank you. Bye That's guys. <laughs>